Tonight on It's a Miracle. A young boy slips into a creek and unable to swim begins fighting for his life. And we start seeing that it's turning into a very serious situation. The boy, he's struggling in the water. After several minutes of this, he finally went down for the last time and he didn't come back up. It was just like watching a, a horror movie. Plus, one of the strangest robberies in the annals of crime. I've been 14 years as a policeman. This is by far the most bizarre case I think I've probably ever had in my career, hopefully. Very, very unusual. <laughs> also, a baby boy born with a rare medical condition is given up for adoption. He was potentially going to have very long-term health care needs, and it takes a very special person to be able to come in and love a child like that. And in the case of this child, it would take a miracle. And now your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show is proof that miracles can happen anywhere, from large urban centers to remote rural areas. It doesn't matter where you are when it's your turn to be touched by a miracle. You could, for instance, be enjoying a day of fishing along a quiet stream, completely unaware that you're about to be visited by angels. It was an unusually hot May afternoon in Decatur, Illinois, and nothing Les West could say would dissuade his two nephews from accompanying him to their favorite fishing hole. It's way too hot and the fish won't probably be biting anyways. But I said, the boys want to go. Just basically have a good old time on a Sunday and uh, come back home and have our own fish story to tell everybody. Which we did have a fish story to tell, but and it wasn't the kind that I wanted to tell. Nine-year-old Ryan Curl was watching out for his five-year-old brother Chad that day. Your line is like under his line and can't bring it up. I wish that Chad could catch something because usually he didn't catch anything. He didn't have good luck with fishing. Give him a little bit uh, more tension in the line. But Chad's luck was about to run out in a much more terrifying way. Nothing's biting. And the boys was getting bored. So we were talking about ending our fishing trip and we were about ready to go home. The water looked pretty good. So I said, let's just dangle our feet in for about five minutes. And Chad, at this age, he adored his big brother. Whatever big brother did, he wanted to be like big brother. At that same moment, across the river, two fishermen, Don Engel and his brother-in-law, Brian, were launching their boat. I could see two small children and a man on the bank they weren't really interested in fishing. They looked like they were having a good time. We were late and we just wanted to get down to where our favorite fishing hole was and just get to it. Ryan turned to climb up the bank. Be careful. And a moment later, disaster struck. Chad, Chad, he's in the water! The first thing I could think of was to jump in and we'd swim together, which was my major mistake. At the moment, wasn't sure whether or not he had actually had slipped in or he had jumped in. Actually, in the beginning, we thought maybe they were swimming down in the water. But Chad could not swim. Grab my head! And we start seeing that it's turning into a very serious situation. The boy, he's struggling with the man in the water. Chad was starting to get hysterical. He was pushing me under, and I couldn't breathe. I was panicking at that point, too. I was losing control. We were both going to go under. The swift undertow began pulling them both down. Chad was trying to keep his head up and trying to move towards the embankment, but he couldn't because he's not a very good swimmer. After several minutes of this, he finally went down for the last time and he didn't come back up. 
It was just like watching a horror movie. Coming up, the desperate search for five-year-old Chad Curl's body. I really didn't think we would find him. It's a real brown water, and there's nothing to see. I was real apprehensive. I'm thinking that he might be dead already. While enjoying an afternoon at a local fishing hole, five-year-old Chad Curl suddenly slipped into the creek and moments later disappeared underwater as two fishermen nearby watched in horror. No matter how fast this boat was gonna go, it was not gonna get there in time for me to go in and recover him before he went underwater. Chad's uncle Les was also struggling to stay above water as nine-year-old Ryan Curl watched helplessly from shore. I was just under the water line, enough that I could see Ryan and barely hear him. And he said, Chad, help! Go! Quick, hurry! Miraculously, Ralph Fortner and his family were taking a detour down Baltimore Road that day. Hey, look! That's Ryan on my baseball team. What's wrong, Ryan? What's the matter? My brother fell in the creek. While Les slowly worked his way to shore, Ralph reluctantly went into the water to look for Chad. I didn't want to go in. I was real apprehensive. I'm thinking that he might be dead already. I saw a man jump in the water. And he didn't know where to look for him. Hey, he's over here, the north side. Got the church here in the middle of the bridge. And he finally moved over to the area where I had last saw him go down. I really didn't think we would find him. It's a real brown water, and there's nothing to see. Time was running out. Without oxygen, brain damage can occur in less than five minutes. And then I held my breath as long as I can, and then I was feeling around. He had that light gray kind of purple color. He was lifeless, he was limp. He was unresponsive when he was pulled out. It was one of the hardest things I ever saw. I've dealt with a lot of death and job-related injuries, and uh, a small child like this, this, this was just real traumatic for me. Anybody know CPR? I do. The newest arrival to the scene, Sherry French, was also the only one present who had taken a course in CPR. I don't consciously remember how to do CPR. But I think that when you start something like that, it's almost as though you're not in control. And I didn't feel like I was in control. I felt as though I was watching myself try so hard to make this child live. And I didn't think I could. <laughs> Somebody asked me if they could help me, and I was so very thankful because I thought he knew CPR. I don't know CPR. Oh, well, just pinch his nose and blow when I tell you to blow. So I did the compressions, and I yelled, blow, and he did. And uh, I tried for a pulse again, and I still couldn't find a pulse. I was scared that he wasn't going to make it. I thought he was just going to die. It didn't look good. He was laying there. He was unresponsive. One, two, three, four, five, they worked on him for quite a while, and then finally he spit up some water. I was thinking the chances were pretty slim that he would not have any brain damage or any permanent injury of some kind. As I was walking away, I started crying. There was no life to him when they took him away. Now, I don't know, it was hopeful thinking. I thought I saw some color in his toes. And if it was in his toes, then maybe it was in his brain. And that's what I was really praying for, that maybe it had done some good. Chad's parents, Diane and Doug Curl, were contacted and rushed to St. Mary's Hospital to be by his side. Uh, we're still playing a waiting game. It's hard to say what's going to happen or where this is going to go. They said because he was about five minutes under the water, that could create you know, brain damage there. Our hearts just dropped. It was very hard. I don't know how to tell you 
how I was feeling. It's, I was scared. 16 hours later, Chad had improved enough to have his nasal gastric tube removed. His parents now could only hope for the best. Hey, Chad, how you doing? You got the tube out of your mouth, now you can talk, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I how you do, bud. That was his first word I really heard, and that couldn't have been any better. I mean, you too. That was the moment right there. Miraculously, Chad had a complete recovery. Right now, you couldn't tell the difference between before and after. There's no side effects or brain damage or anything. Les West is very grateful that his nephew was given a second chance. I'm a highlight of his life. He's a highlight of my life. He's very excited to come see Uncle Les and ready to go out and do whatever we have planned for that day. And I really want to go fishing again, except one thing. I don't want to go fishing where I was, because there's a too strong of an undercurrent. Recently, Chad and his family had a reunion with the angels who saved his life, and everyone there was struck by the incredible circumstances that brought them together. First, Ralph Fortner had no business being on the road that day. I'm only on Baltimore Road because my wife griped at me because we had to get something to eat. That was the quickest way to get to the store. Otherwise, I'm at home. I'm home sitting on my couch. <laughs> Instead, Ralph was bravely diving to find Chad's body, but he would never have found it if Don Engel hadn't been there to point the way. I believe the good Lord put us all there at the right time, at the right place. Anybody know CPR? I do. And one of the people put there was Sherry French, the only person who'd stopped to help who knew CPR. We were only instruments. And we were so thankful, each of us, that we had that little bit of knowledge that we needed to do it. Every person that was there contributed. I don't think that we would have came out with the outcome that we had if any one of them were not there. All that makes it a miracle. If you're interested in learning more about real people whose lives were changed through an encounter with angels, look for Angels on Earth, available through Guidepost Publications. We'll be right back. Next, Colleen Jacobson is a roving bank teller and starting her first day at a new branch. It will be a day she will never forget. May I help you whoever's next? I've never had an experience like this. Would you cash this check for me, please? Talking to my husband, I said, I would Jimmy the Greek like these odds? I mean, they, they're just phenomenal. Our next story comes from the new book, Small Miracles for Women, by our good friends Yitta Halberstam and Judith Leventhal. And while it may be a small miracle, it's one you're likely to be talking about for some time. So get ready to witness an attempted robbery in broad daylight, a crime that might have gone as planned, if it weren't for a truly remarkable twist of fate. It was March 30th, 2000, just another day for the citizens of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, or so Colleen Jacobson thought as she woke that morning. It was like any other morning. It was a matter of turning the alarm off, getting the coffee going, reading maybe the front page of the paper. Well, look what time it is. I've got to get going. I'm not going to be late. It was the challenge to get ready and out Take the care. door on time to be where I was supposed to be. For over seven years, Colleen had worked as a roving bank teller. A rover's like a substitute teacher. You're going to fill in and help the team that is short people. You could be called to a branch for a day, for two days, for a week. I had never worked at this branch before. Colleen didn't know that her day was about to turn into something bordering on the miraculous. This was going to be my last week of roving. It was already arranged. I had applied and was accepted at a branch in the suburbs. And I was looking forward to this week, sort of as a finale and just something new, somewhere I had never been before. It was the beginning of a routine day at the bank. Nine o'clock comes around and there was already a line formed out the door. They started coming in. 
and I probably waited on maybe one, two customers. Okay, it's just went in. It's available for you today. And then, as she had done thousands of times before, Colleen beckoned to the next customer in line. May I help them to our next? Would you cash this check for me, please? Certainly. As I tick the check, uh, right away I noticed it was the same design that I have. What Colleen noticed next would send her blood pressure sky high. When I took the driver's license off the check, I saw my name. Then I saw my husband's name, and I thought, this is my check. Why would this woman have my check? My mind was racing, my heart was racing, but I had to get it in my head. Now, what do I do? What do I do next? What have we been trained? What have we been taught to do? Somehow, Colleen managed to come up with a stalling tactic until she gathered her wits about her. I was somewhat flustered. I didn't want her to get suspicious, so I just told her I was having trouble with the computer, that it wasn't going through. And meanwhile, I'm tapping on the keys to make like I was trying to process the check. Feeling more and more distressed, Colleen turned to teller coordinator, Tracy Welsh, for help. Call security now. This is my check, and I did not write it, OK? I'm just having a little trouble with the computer, getting it to go through. Just be a second. Tracy didn't waste any time alerting security guard Michael Snyder of the problem. I informed him of the situation, and Colleen was stalling so that he would keep her in the in the bank longer. And I asked her um, what, what the check was for, which you would not normally do, but I was just trying to get a conversation going, and she said, uh, it was for some clothes. Oh. You know, the lady that wrote the check is outside. I could go out and get her. That would be helpful. Well, I mm -hmm. thought she wasn't going to be coming back, which of course she had no plans to. And I signaled to Michael, that's her, you know, go get her, that's, that's her. I then started following her probably about 20 to 30 feet behind her. She turned around and saw me. At that point, she started to run. Ma'am, there's a problem with your check. I need to come back to the bank. All along, I knew that they had already called the police as soon as I left the bank, but they were trying to find me. Officer Donald Erb was on duty nearby. I received a radio dispatch call. I proceeded to check the immediate area where she was last seen, and I was not able to, to locate either the, the security officer or the, uh, the female that was described to me. The suspect had led Michael Snyder several blocks from the bank when she attempted to get rid of the checkbook. I was trying to subdue her when I observed two gentlemen looking at me. Can you guys help me here? She was still struggling and was still kicking. We lifted her up off the ground a little bit and then laid her down onto the sidewalk. Ma'am, relax until the police get here. A few minutes later, Officer Herb arrived and then took the woman into custody. With the suspect finally subdued, it was time to piece together how she'd come into possession of Colleen's checks in the first place. Upon interviewing Colleen Jacobson, she advised me that she had ordered some new checks and would never had received those checks. What we had heard later was that it was not our regular mailman. There was a substitute that day. And the checks couldn't fit through the door slot. And his reasoning was he would just put them at the door so I would have them uh, when I came home. Unfortunately, the checks ended up in the wrong hands. The woman was subsequently charged with forgery and placed in custody pending a verdict in the Court of Common Pleas. Her actions that day had set into motion the most extraordinary chain of coincidences that anyone could have ever imagined. I've been there 14 years as a policeman. This is by far the most bizarre case I think I've probably ever had in my career, hopefully. I'm sure I probably, it, probably the most bizarre case I ever will have. I'm sure it's very, very unusual. <laughs> Colleen had never been to our branch before. And this was her last week roving. She was going to a permanent position. I mean, everything that transpired was just, just, just bizarre. <laughs> the chances of her bringing the teller's check in 
on the day that she happened to be working at our bank. Okay, I hope never snacks. Just everything involved with the whole story, I think, was pretty amazing. <laughs> I've never had an experience like this. As surprised as I was when I saw that check was mine, I imagine it was no match to her surprise when they told her later who she had handed the check to. Talking to my husband, I said, I would Jimmy the Greek like these odds? I mean, they, they're just phenomenal. It was just unbelievable. Still to come, the story of a daughter's special relationship with her sick and dying father. Patty was a joy to have her on. She sent me a Father's Day card, and then she drew in, in her own handwriting, a picture of a new healthy heart. And it was an emotional thing for me. I thought that was so sweet. Discover the amazing bond they share when It's a Miracle continues. Welcome back. And now the story of a young girl who loved her father with all her heart. It's a love he continues to feel every day of his life, even though she is no longer in it. And it's a love that will surely touch your heart as well. Chet Zuber and his wife Jean live on a Christmas tree farm in northern Michigan. And together, they raised a family of six children. But just before their youngest was born, Chet began experiencing serious health problems. And at the age of 35, he had his first heart attack. My whole world collapsed down around me. And all of a sudden, I got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel. And at that time, if you lived 10 years after a heart attack, that's, you were doing pretty good. He kept getting weaker and um, you know, it was hard for him to come up the basement stairs. He couldn't go for a long walk. Chet was diagnosed with advanced arteriosclerosis. He had the heart of a 70-year-old. Over the next 15 years, he would suffer several more heart attacks and endure three coronary bypass operations. In 1987, when I had the third bypass surgery, and during the third surgery, I had a massive heart attack and I never recovered from that. Chet's poor health forced him to retire from his job in sales. Now home full time, he was finally able to develop deep relationships with his children. He became especially close to his youngest daughter, Patty. <laughs> you gonna let her hold a baby looking like that? For the record, Patty and I got along quite well. Do it again. <laughs> she was a joy to have her on. And she was deeply concerned about her father's condition. She sent me a Father's Day card that says, if I had my way, I'd buy you the biggest automobile, uh, the biggest TV. And then she drew in, in her own handwriting, a picture of a new healthy heart. And it was an emotional thing for me. I, I thought that was so sweet. Patty's concern led her to an interest in the medical field, and eventually she became a state-certified medical assistant. At about the same time, Chet's doctor placed him on the heart transplant list. He says, don't get your hopes up high. He says, the organs are very scarce. But he says, that's the only chance you've got. I had so much heart damage by that time that there was nothing left to work with. We live close to Beaumont Hospital. I knew that they brought these hearts in by helicopter. I heard every helicopter, I swear, for four years, day and night. It was this long and painful wait that may have inspired Patty to make a very personal decision. We were sitting down at dinner, and as we were passing food around a table, she just casually mentioned she'd stop and fill out her organ donor card that day. And I thought, gee, that's nice. And I never thought about it again. Patty's interest in medicine intensified. And in 1994, she enrolled in some nursing classes at a local college. But before school began, she decided to join a friend on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It would prove to be a fateful decision. In the wee hours of the morning on August 18th, the car Patty was riding in was involved in a horrible crash. A short while later, her parents were awakened with the tragic news. On the other end of the line was a 
doctor from a trauma unit at the University of Tennessee Medical Center telling me that Patty's injuries were severe. He says, don't even bother coming down as death appears to be but moments away. And we were both in shock, disbelief. We felt helpless. Here you have a child dying 700 miles away and there's nothing you can do. I was just like stunned. I just, I couldn't believe it. And he got up and he said, you know, he said, Patty had said, you know, she'd signed her donor card. Should I call them back and let them know that? And I said, yes. So I called the hospital back. I got a hold of the same doctor and I says, doctor, I says, you do everything you can to save this child's life. But if things don't work out, it was Patty's wish to be an organ donor. The next day, Patty was still alive, but on life support. Her parents flew to the University of Tennessee Medical Center to be near her. And Patty was laying there on a monitor. I could see that her heart was beating. I could see her chest move. She was breathing, although with a native respirator. So I thought, maybe, just maybe, the doctors were wrong, and, and, and Patty's going to recover from this. But sadly, that was not meant to be. And two days later, a neurologist pronounced Patty Zuber brain dead. Everything was over. All our hopes, our prayers, our wishes uh, didn't work out. But the Zubers could still honor Patty's last wishes. And so they met with Susan Friedenberg Cross of the Tennessee Organ Donor Services. I would guess in Mr. and Mrs. Zuber's life that that was the worst day that they have experienced. And for them to consider transplanting organs to other people they've never met is just a completely altruistic gift. Susan had learned that Chet was waiting for a heart transplant, but said nothing. It was very clear to me that we were not there to talk about him receiving Patty's heart. This was a family who wanted to help other people, and they were not thinking about themselves at all. Chet and Jean signed the necessary forms, and only then did Susan say what was on her mind. I know, Mr. Zuber, you're on the heart transplant list. I told him that he had the right to designate where any of her organs would go. I told him that he could receive Patty's heart. And this was a total shock to me. I'd never, ever considered it. No one in the family had ever considered it. Who would think of something like that? And a million things went through my mind. Is this right? Is this ethical? Can I stand the thought of every heartbeat reminding me of Patty? Is this a selfish move? And I says, no. I thought he was making a, a spur of the moment decision and that if he really thought about it, this is what Patty would have wanted. Disappointed, Susan began searching for another recipient for Patty's heart. Meanwhile, Chet spent some time alone with his thoughts, but he soon discovered that he wasn't alone. I had a long corridor to walk down to get to the area of the hospital where our room was in. While I was waiting for the elevator, now I, I don't want to sound corny here, but I swear it was Patty pleading with me to accept her heart. My God, I says, how can I explain to my family what had occurred to me at that elevator? He called me in and he said, you know, he, walking back, he thought that this is really what Patty would have wanted. The Zubers set off to find Susan, hoping it wouldn't be too late. But fortunately, her evaluation of Patty's heart had taken much longer than normal. It was unbelievable, the kind of problems I encountered. We spent probably two or three hours just trying to get a picture of the heart. Normally, at that point in the process, I know I would have made one, at least two, calls. Based on the extra time that it took for me to evaluate Patty's heart, I'm sure that I would have already placed the heart with one of the recipients. Miraculously, the delay had bought Chet the time he needed to accept Patty's gift. At 3.56 a.m. on Monday, August 22nd, Patty Zuber's heart beat in her body 
for the last time, and less than six hours later, it began beating again inside the chest of her father. I woke up from surgery feeling well, and I've never had a bad day since. The rapid recovery was unbelievable. Boy, his skin was pink, his lips were colorful again, and they just did remarkably well after that. Patty's heart and spirit also live on in a special place on the farm. We have dedicated a park across the river here as Patty's Park. It's just a place to go and sit and be quiet. I believe in miracles more all the time. My faith is deeper. I always said that I would never get through it if I ever lost one of my kids. But you know what, I had an inner faith that came to me and, um, and I believe, Pat, you know, Patty watching over us. And I think that's what she really wanted. There's not a day goes by when I don't think about Patty. And there's not a day that goes by that somewhere in my prayers that I don't thank Patty for the gift that she has given me. I realize that if I had not accepted Patty's heart, I would have regretted that decision the rest of my life. Because it's truly a gift a gift like no other, that I have experienced the greatest miracle, the sight of heaven. The spirit of Patty Zuber lives on in the lives of her father and mother, and they join us now from their home in Black River, Michigan. Hello, Jean. Chet. Hello, Richard. Hello, Richard. Thank you both for being on the show tonight. Chet, how are you feeling these days? I feel wonderful. Great. And Jean, how does it feel to have your husband healthy again? It's been great. We're able to travel and do things that we weren't able to do before. And I understand you travel quite a bit to talk about organ donation. We've been to many cities and um, organizations, medical conferences, um, trying to promote organ donation. Oh, that's wonderful. Chet, your daughter was a very giving person. I suppose you could say that what was once in her heart is now in yours. Is that why you're continuing to promote organ donation? Well, that's my goal, uh, Richard, to make people aware of the need and the importance for organ donation. Uh, there is no need for people today to die because of end-stage organ failure. Doctors today know how to successfully transplant organs. There are many medicines on the market that fight rejections. Post-transplant care is in place. Everything's in place but a necessary number of organs. You must be very proud of your daughter's decision to donate. We believe that as Patty looks back and down and sees all of the good that she has done, that Patty has to be the happiest little angel in heaven. What a shame that would have been to bury those organs. And what a blessing that that didn't happen. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We'll be right back. Not everyone believes in miracles, but people who have experienced them firsthand know that they are wondrous events that need no explanation, like the lucky people in our next story. On December 6, 1991, a baby boy was born at the University Medical Center in Lubbock, Texas, suffering from a rare condition called omphalocele. The infant's tiny abdominal organs were growing outside his body, and his brain and heart could be malformed as well. Following emergency surgery, the child was placed in the care of neonatal nurse Holly Freeman. At first, she was shocked by what she saw. It was hardly any baby to look at. There were IVs all over the child. He had a tube that helps him breathe, which means a big piece of tape over his face and across his lip. He also had a tube down his throat that helped keep everything out of his stomach. But he had such expressive eyes, and his hair was so fuzzy, and it stuck up everywhere. And so everybody was just drawn to look at him and say, oh, he's cute, isn't he sweet? Look how pretty he is. Holly and the other nurses showered the infant with love and attention, knowing that his birth mother had given him up for adoption. Three days old, he was alone, with no family, no name, and little hope of ever being adopted. He was potentially going to have very long-term health care needs. 
and that not only is expensive, but it's also expensive in terms of um, your emotions and your time. And it takes a very special person to be able to come in and love a child like that immediately. The job of finding the baby a family was assigned to adoption caseworker Connie Grimes. It's really hard to try to figure out which family would go with which baby, even with a fully healthy baby. We didn't know how well or how badly he was going to do because it was such an unusual situation. It's just a game of roulette, almost, to know what might happen to him once he got older. Connie could only find one family willing to adopt a special needs baby. But when they visited him in the hospital, his condition was more than they could handle. Oh, the poor baby. You can touch him. Oh, oh, I'm afraid. It's just really hard to see such a tiny thing with all these tubes and wires and ventilators. It's kind of hard to put into words what you, what you feel. It's a baby. It's still a baby, and it's still something miraculous, even, even with all that hanging on it. Oh, my. I was so afraid that because they pitied him, they would feel like they needed to take him. It's OK. I was glad that they didn't, because he didn't need pity. With no other applicants for special needs children on file, Connie didn't know where to turn. And then she remembered Marilyn and Royce May. His red hair reminded me of Marilyn. And I don't think on their application that they had put down anything about special needs children. But for some reason, I just thought of Marilyn and Royce. The Mays lived on a farm about an hour away from Lubbock. Connie had helped them adopt a baby boy three years earlier. And she knew they were looking for a sibling for their son. Hello. When Hi, Connie, Connie called, I was going? heading to Lubbock. In fact, I was running late. We have a new baby over at UMC. And I can't really tell you why, but it sounded like it was our child, and I hadn't even met him yet. You're not going to believe this. Marilyn immediately radioed her husband, who was busy tending the crops. Royce was working out in the field. We were expecting a storm, so he could not leave the crop. I was going to Lubbock. I would just run by the hospital and see him. What do you think? So he told me, well, you go on to Lubbock and visit the baby, get all the details that you can get from the nurses and the doctors, and then come back and fill me in. Marilyn headed for the hospital on her own, and when she was finally able to see the child, she knew her instincts had been correct. It was love at first sight. I saw this baby laying there, and he was just looking around. And he just looked up at me with those big blue eyes. And if he could have talked, I would have expected him to say, I love you, Mom, because there was a connection there. I walked into the nursery, and there was a woman wrapped around the baby's bed. Oh, hi. Can I touch him? Yes, you can touch him. She you was like leaning that? down, looking in that baby's face. And I went, this is the one. Holly explained the little boy's medical problems to Marilyn, but nothing could distract her from the love she felt for this child. When I came home, I basically told Royce that I fell in love with the baby instantly. Marilyn explained to me, you know, you look in his eyes, you know, and you see him, and, you know, she just fell in love with him. She was already so. Marilyn returned to the hospital the next day. This time, however, her reaction was very different. Immediately, my first thought was, this child has gotten very ill overnight. He, he's taken a turn for the worse. And I turned to Holly and asked her what had what happened mean? during the night that all of a sudden he required all this equipment. Yesterday, he didn't have all of these tubes and the machine. And, and yeah, she yeah, really looked puzzled. And it took her a few minutes. And I think then she realized that I had not seen those tubes the day before. All she remembers seeing is his eyes, and she doesn't remember all of the other things around, and I thought that was a miracle in itself. Somehow, Marilyn had been blinded to the real condition of this baby, blinded long enough for her to open her heart to him. And so, the Mays adopted a new son who they called Britton. But it would take another miracle for Britton to stay alive. 
He had several complications that we didn't know initially and until they were diagnosed, you know, you always have to wonder what's going on. Is the baby got something that's going to kill him? We did often think that he might die. We had a doctor and he said there were many nights that the doctors went home and just knew he wouldn't be alive the next morning. He said, this is God's will that this little boy is here today. And he said, he's a true miracle. Finally, after seven months of close calls and medical emergencies, the Mays took their miracle baby home. And here we are, finally. Yeah, first pictures at home. And today, eight-year-old Britton May is making remarkable progress, thanks in part to the devotion of his older brother, Regan. I do believe in miracles. Lots of times going to the hospital, I heard my dad and mom talking to the doctors, and they were saying, this boy's not going to be alive tomorrow. And I remember going home thinking, is that really true? But I didn't ever believe it. I love him dearly, more than any other brother can. Oh, I think there's definitely a miracle. Finding parents that will accept him no matter what, because they were really not sure what would happen. He might be perfectly okay, he might not. And the chances were he might not be okay. We had put in for a normal, healthy child. So the adoption agency had no reason to call us about a special needs child. The fact that I had not seen the tubes, to me, was a miracle. We looked at it like God just picked us, and he blessed his family with Britain. We've got to experience so many things, so many rewarding things by Britain being in our family. I have seen so many babies that had poor prognosis for the future, <laughs> but with a good, healthy, loving family, you overcome that, and at Britain, oh my gosh, he has the best chance. Oh yeah. Because he's got everything he needs there. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>